Start in Isaiah 52 and verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many as were a stony to thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his four more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was not despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And so this passage that we've been reading week after week, Isaiah 52, 13 to Isaiah 53, 12. It presents different aspects of Messiah's ministry, not only to Israel, but to the whole world. And the language and the literary style of Isaiah is actually typical of the poetic forms that are found throughout the Old Testament prophets. And so you can almost break this portion of scripture as you can others into stanzas and Verses 13 to 15 are actually the first stanza, if you will, of a five stanza poem. And they introduce two contrasting ideas or two contrasting themes that will both be larger in the next chapter and in the subsequent stanzas as we read chapter 53. But specifically those three verses at the end of chapter 52, they reveal that Messiah will both suffer and be exalted. And that's why... The the Jews struggled with this passage for hundreds of years before Messiah came, before Jesus came, because they saw the exalted Messiah. And they couldn't con- they couldn't reconcile the suffering Messiah with the exalted Messiah. But in verse 13, we see here that God Himself is the speaker. He says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, and he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And so it starts with an exalted Messiah. And then in verse 13, As many were as stony to thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his four more than the sons of men. And so they saw the suffering Messiah. But the exalted Messiah came before the suffering Messiah. And so they were expecting Messiah to come and to be exalted and maybe at some point to suffer, but he would be exalted first. Remember, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, the prophet was looking backwards. He was in the future, he was looking backwards. And so telling the story backwards, he tells us of the exaltation and then he tells us of the suffering. So you had people in Jesus' day who... Because the suffering came before the exaltation, because they never saw the exaltation, they had a hard time accepting that he was the Messiah. Verse 15, 
says, so shall he sprinkle many nations, the king shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. And so you go from exaltation to suffering and back to exaltation. In life, a suffering always precedes glory. But the order is reversed in these three verses. And again, remember the prophet is looking backwards. And so the prophet talks about the exaltation in the future tense. And the verses about the suffering are in the past tense. Because again, remember the prophet is in the future and he's looking backwards. He's toward the end of world history and he's looking backwards. So the prophet was seeing Christ's suffering as a past event. But the exaltation was a point that was still in the future. Even in verse 3 of chapter 53, the Messiah is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. In verse 4, he's stricken, he's smitten of God, he's afflicted. In verse 7, he's oppressed, he's afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter. In verse 8, he's cut off from the land of the living, which is a Hebrew expression for death. In verse 9, he's being buried after his death. In verse 10, he dies as a guilt offering. In verse 12, he hath poured out his soul unto death. And so we see the suffering Messiah, but we also see this, the exalted Messiah. Look at verse 10. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied in verse 11. In verse 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. All of those statements presuppose a resurrection. The language of those three verses in Isaiah 52 emphasize that everything about the servant of the Lord is astonishing. His character is death. His resurrection is exaltation. And verse 13 opens with the word behold. And then verse 14 says many are astonished at him. Verse 15 says the kings of the earth shut their mouths because of him and that he will open their eyes to see and they'll have understanding of things that they had never imagined. So the Messiah comes in humiliation and again in exaltation. So we see the first coming and the second coming of Messiah. Themes that are developed further in Isaiah 53, they're all introduced in those three verses we read again and again, verses 13, 14, and 15 of Isaiah 52 which begin in Isaiah 52, 13 with that word, behold. It's really a common Hebrew word. It's used more than a thousand times in the Old Testament. And it's a word that demands attention. It, it could be translated as like, look, or observe. It's used in the book of Zechariah four times. All four times referring to Messianic prophecies like in Zechariah 3, 8. Again, speaking with the voice of God, introducing Messiah as my servant, the branch. Zechariah 6.12, that word behold, points to the man whose name is the branch, emphasizing Messiah's humanity. Zechariah 9.9 uses the word to highlight the famous prophecy, behold, thy king cometh. He's just, having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Isaiah 40 and verse 9 says, Get thee up into the high mountain and say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. We find there in Isaiah 40 and verse 9, the same four titles, servant, man, king, and God. In the four gospels, Mark portrays Jesus as the suffering servant. Luke writes of Jesus as the son of man. Matthew presents Jesus as the king of the Jews. And in John's gospel, Jesus is the creator of God who became flesh. That word translated servant refers to one who did hard work in obedience to his master. A, a servant does not act independently to fulfill his own desires and will, but he seeks to please his master. The, the word itself describes somebody who is duty bound to obey his master. The exact parallel word in English would be slave. But when scripture employs that word to speak of someone serving God, it's with lofty and not demeaning connotations. It was used in the Old Testament of Abraham in Genesis 26, of Isaac in Genesis 24, of Jacob in Ezekiel 28, of Moses in Exodus 14, of David 
in 2 Samuel 3 of Joshua and Joshua 24 of Elijah in 2 Kings 10 of Isaiah himself in Isaiah 20 of Job in Job chapter 1 and of the prophets in general in 2 Kings 17. In the case of Messiah in Isaiah 52, 13, it says the servant of the Lord or the slave of the Lord shall deal prove it prudently. That word prudently, it's a Hebrew word that speaks of someone who performs their task with skill and expertise. In other words, Messiah's eventual exaltation is not owing to some accidental success or to good fortune because he will not fail to accomplish God's will because he will prudently employ a righteous means to achieve the noblest of results. Which is why you see praise for the servant in verse 13. It says he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. You think that's redundant, but it's not. It's rather it's an escalation. It goes from high to higher to highest. The ascending degrees parallel Christ's resurrection. That's the high. And then his ascension is higher and culminating in the highest, which is his coronation, when he becomes king of kings and lord of lords, and the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever. And you know, it's funny, because one of the most famous pieces of music for Christmas is Handel's Messiah. And Handel is not, the holy, of course, is not singing of the baby in the manger. It's singing of the coronation of the second coming of Messiah when he's declared King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Forever and ever, King of Kings, forever and ever, and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And the story goes that the first time that that was ever sung, I want to say Elizabeth I was the queen. No, Elizabeth II isn't quite that old. She's old, but she's not that old. I want to say Elizabeth I was the queen. And as the choir began to sing, And he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the queen stands up. She's so taken up in the thought of of Jesus being crowned king of the world and reigning forever. She's so taken up in the thought of the second coming of Messiah that she stands up and she begins to applaud and shout. And she just kind of has her uh, one of those Pentecostal camp meeting fits, if you will. And the crowd of of British royalty and nobility and dignitaries, they don't know what to do. Because the queen is standing up and she's having a fit. And the queen's just standing up and having a fit. And so what do they do? So they just begin to applaud and cheer. And hence the standing ovation was born. So you say, what was the thought that that inspired the first standing ovation of the world, it was the thought of Messiah, not in his first coming, but in his second. But no one ever acted so wisely or as a result was so highly exalted. The one clear fact that we cannot escape is that Messiah's suffering was planned, it was purposeful, it was successful. There are some critics and skeptics that try to write Jesus off as a failure. They say, He was a promising but disappointing figure whose crucifixion made him a martyr instead of a messiah. As if the cross marked the sudden collapse of the grand plan. His death, they claim, was tragic and the unfortunate end to a well-intended life. But nothing could be further from the truth because his death and all of its horror and anguish was prophesied centuries earlier in Isaiah 53. The passage makes it undeniably, undeniably clear that Jesus was not the victim. But rather, as Isaiah said, he acted prudently. In other words, he knew exactly how his life would end down to the minutest detail. He had known it before the foundation of the world. This was the very plan of salvation. And Jesus understood every prophetic passage in the Old Testament. And he knew that this was coming. And he even rebuked his disciples for not understanding. In Luke 24, And Jesus was talking to his disciples in verse 25, and he said, Oh, fools and slow of heart, 
How would you like it if I was preaching this morning and I called you all a bunch of slow-hearted fools? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then in verse 44, he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. In other words, Jesus himself had told his disciples about his coming death again and again and throughout the course of his ministry. And despite his clear predictions that he would die, those that were closest to him were totally caught off guard. They were astonished. They were confused. And when he was crucified, they didn't know what to do. As we look back and we meditate on the cross, we're amazed at how Jesus was treated. As we read a chapter like Isaiah 53, we tremble when we read the statements that Jesus made during his lifetime, realizing that he fully knew what lay ahead for him. The fact that these were foretold in such careful detail, it doesn't mitigate the wonder of the cross, but rather it magnifies it that the servant of the Lord, the promised deliverer, would be put on a public display in such a humiliating and horrifying fashion. And that's the very word that Isaiah uses in Isaiah 52, 14. He says, as many were astonied at thee. That word astonied in our modern vernacular would be the word astonished. He goes on to say his visage was so marred more than any man and his four more than the sons of men. In other words, there's a sudden shift in topic. We go from exaltation in verse 13, and now in verse 14, we're at humiliation. There's no warning. There's no transition. Just go from the exalted Messiah to everybody's astonished at how horribly he was beaten and humiliated. And the death of the promised Messiah was equally shocking, if you will. It was equally astonishing. And so no one besides Jesus himself was prepared for it. That Hebrew word for astonished or astonied, it's a rich one. The English word of astonishment is capable of being used in a po positive sense. But astonishment, or the Hebrew word shamem, it's a word that's never used to describe a positive reaction. It would be closer to the English word appalled. The same Hebrew word is used quite frequently in the Old Testament, and it's translated like left desolate or left waste. Or In the context of Isaiah 52, 14, there's a connotation of horror. In other words, it speaks of a shock so staggering that one loses control of his rational faculties. It, it can be translated numbed or petrified or paralyzed. It's a strong word and it has a broad range of uses, but it has a very clear meaning. In other words, those who saw the death of Messiah were devastated. The damage that was done to him, look at Isaiah 52, 14. His visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. In other words, Messiah was so disfigured from the sufferings afflicted upon him, they couldn't even recognize him as a human being. It began in the Garden of Gethsemane in the night of his arrest and betrayal. If you remember, he was in prayer and he was in deep anguish and physical exhaustion. And he's praying, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And as he thinks, he says, let this cup pass from me. And he looks into the cup. And he sees everything that he will suffer for sinners. And he says, Father, let this cup pass from me. And the Bible says he begins to sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Imagine how weak and haggard looking he must have been when he went to trial, having just literally sweat blood. But what left him so marred beyond human semblance were the tortures that were inflicted upon him before he even went to the cross. We know from the gospel accounts that he was struck on the head he was spit upon, he was mocked, he was flogged, he was beaten and abused by the chief priests and then by the temple guards and then by the Romans. And then add to that the terrible scourging he received on Pilate's orders. To be flogged with the Roman scourge was a severe, even life-threatening punishment. As he was beaten mercifully with which what was called a flagellum. In other words, it was a stick with leather straps, and at the end of each of those leather straps were sharp pieces of bone and iron and glass, and the victim would be tied to a post with his hands above his head, and his feet would be suspended off the ground, which would cause his body to be stretched and taut. And as 
that glass and bone and steel would latch into his flesh. And then they would pull the whip away and it would just literally peel the flesh off of the body. And the muscles would be lacerated and the veins would be cut and the internal organs would be exposed and the trauma for some would be fatal in and of itself. And then to go from that to crucifixion, which was the most brutal, brutal form of public execution that it was ever devised. The injuries that Messiah would suffer were unspeakably savage. As death by crucifixion seemed to include all that pain and death can have. There's dizziness and then cramps and then thirst and then starvation and then sleeplessness and then traumatic fever and tetanus and public shame and continuing torment and the horror of the anticipation of it all and the mortification of untended wounds and it all just intensifies up to the point when you would think it can't be endured anymore and you would finally gain the relief of unconsciousness, but it doesn't come right away. The unnatural position made every movement painful. The lacerated veins and crushed tendons would throb with anguish as the wounds inflamed by exposure begin to gangrene. The arteries, especially of the head and the stomach, they swell up. And while each of these miseries went on gradually increasing, there's added to them the intolerable pain of a burning and raging thirst. Remember, Jesus cried from the cross. He said, I thirst. Isaiah 52 and verse 14 has to be understood in that light. The brutal treatment of Jesus suffered. He was maimed. He was mangled. He hardly looked like a human. And the people, astonishment. Remember in the Bible, there's a passage in Matthew that I've always struggled with. And it just at this very moment, it made sense to me. It says that they went by the cross and they wagged their heads at him. I know how a dog wags its tail, but how do you wag your head? There was that much shock and repulsiveness at what they saw upon that cross. They could no longer even recognize him as a human being. And so their repulsiveness, their astonishment, if you will, took the form of literally wagging their heads. This was not their concept of Messiah. This was not the exalted king that they thought Isaiah had prophesied. His degradation was the deepest possible. It was the most severe. It was the most horrible. But in contrast, his exaltation will be the highest, the most profound, and the most glorious. The way Isaiah 52, 12, 13, 14, and 15 shifts from scene to scene, it was very difficult for the readers to follow because they knew nothing of Christ. In Isaiah 52, 13, the servant of the Lord is high and lifted up and exalted. And then verse 14, we get that shocking past tense glimpse of so marred and beyond human semblance. And then again in verse 15, once more, uh, the scene and the verb tense and the tone, they all change abruptly. And we're looking ahead to Christ's glorious return when all the kings of the earth shall fall before him and all the nations shall serve him. And even the Gentile nations and Gentile kings are left speechless in verse 15. It says, he shall sprinkle many nations and the kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see and that which they had not heard shall they consider. That word sprinkle is one of a few possible translations of the Hebrew word nazah. It literally means to spurt or to spatter. The word can also mean to cause to leap or to startle. If you read this same passage in Isaiah in the Greek, it says many nations will be amazed at him. Kings will keep their mouths shut. Jesus, in his second coming, just as they were so astonished, at his humiliation in his first coming, and all they could do was wag their heads. When Jesus comes the second time, the kings of the earth will look at him in his exaltation, and all the, they won't even be able to speak. Kings and politicians, you would think, always have something to say. But they'll be speechless. And the nations of the world will see it. 
You know, I've often wondered, is, is it going to be, you know, CNN breaking news? Jesus coming through the clouds. You know, I'd love to see the look on Wolf Blitzer's face. You thought that you thought that that um, you thought Wolf Blitzer had a uh, had a nice look on his face when John King called the Electoral College for Donald Trump in 2016. You ought to see the look on his face when he's looking at the screen and Jesus is coming through the clouds. But I'll tell you what he's going to do because he's Jewish. He's going to he's, he's going to see him who was pierced. And he's finally going to embrace his Messiah. See, he couldn't embrace Donald Trump as, 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 as his president for four years, but he'll embrace Jesus as Messiah when he sees him coming through the clouds. That's how, that's how astonished, that's how awed, that's how shocked the world is going to be. Jesus told of the day himself in Matthew 24. He said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. God the Father will install his Son as the King of the world, and the kings of the earth will see it, and they will be terrified. Psalm chapter 2 says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. King of kings forever and ever. And Lord of lords. Have you ever noticed that most prophecies emphasize how the second coming of Jesus catches everybody unaware, catches them off guard? Even today, vast numbers of people worldwide profess faith, and yet most people are not looking for the return of Jesus. The same was true when Messiah came the first time. The prophets had prophesied. God's people had been awaiting Messiah for centuries, but yet he came and it took everybody by surprise. Those three verses uttered by God himself in Isaiah 52, 13, 14, and 15 about Messiah's astonishing revelation and humiliation and exaltation they're only the introduction to the full message that Isaiah is going to deliver in chapter 53. And so next week, as we go back to chapter 53, we'll come face to face with the most appalling fact of all. And that's namely that Messiah's astonishing rejection, even at a time when messianic expectation was at its peak, he was met with the most vehement scorn and refusal. His own people, Isaiah 53 and verse 3 says, despised and rejected him. And that's the tragic reality that we'll come back to next Sunday. Not the suffering servant or the exalted servant, but the rejected servant. And so, Father, I thank you that Jesus came. Thank you that he's coming again. And pray, Lord Jesus, even next week as we look at the fact that he was rejected. Pray that we know that not all men have rejected him. And pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us, even this week, to lead somebody to him. Pray, Lord Jesus, you'd bless our food, bless our fellowship. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.